Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, we've gotten through our third hour exam by hook or by crook, or possibly both. Uh, and today I'd like to start us in on chapter nine, which by the way, uh, welcome to Organic Chemistry 2, pretty much officially. Uh, in the two semester sequence, carbonyl chemistry dominates that second semester. Uh, and I think we need to cover it here too because carbonyl compounds occur everywhere in nature. Ketones, aldehydes, also esters, carboxylic acids, so many other types of carbonyl containing compounds. Carbonyl being, of course, C double bond O. And the good news is there's very much in common uh, that all carbonyl containing compounds share in terms of their reactivity. Certainly there are also differences between the different carbonyl containing functional groups. In this chapter, we're gonna focus on aldehydes and ketones. And uh, um, uh, both of which again occur in all kinds of different biologically relevant compounds. These functional groups are legion in all kinds of uh, pharmaceuticals for both humans and animals and goodness knows how many other uh, compounds we use to treat soil or treat water. They're just everywhere. And so I think it's important to know something about how these things behave. Uh, first of all, um, barring uh, any other review, uh, I, should, I should mention in terms of naming these that the IUPAC um, suffix for the aldehyde functional group is al, and for the ketone functional group is own. And so uh, if you see some strange name that ends in al, you'll know that you're looking at an aldehyde and some equally strange name that ends in own, you're gonna be looking at a ketone. Uh, that being said, there's many uh, smaller uh, compounds that have trivial names, names that have been around for so long and are used so commonly uh, that people use them preferentially. Uh, for instance, you already learned about acetophenone and benzaldehyde way back in chapter four uh, when we learned about aromatic compounds. And these are two extremely commonly used uh, benzene derivatives. And so I suppose one could call, for instance, acetophenone methylphenyl ketone, or even, how do you like this one, 1-phenyl-1-ethanone but I can assure you that no one calls it either of those things. Uh, somewhat more complicated compounds uh, are, are better named using the IUPAC system. This compound here, for instance, would be called 4-methylpentanal because carbon-1 is assumed to be the one that has the aldehyde functional group. Also notice CHO is an acceptable way of abbreviating the aldehyde functional groups. I could, have, I could have put CHO attached to the benzene ring here. The reason we do that instead of COH is because OH now looks like an alcohol. So that's the reason we use CHO for the abbreviation for the aldehyde functional group. <clears throat> As always, using these abbreviations on your own is entirely optional. If you don't like any or all of these abbreviations, it's never mandatory to use them. All I expect is that when you see these abbreviations used, you understand them. Uh, other common abbreviations we've seen so far are maybe CO2H or COOH for a carboxylic acid functional group. What about PH for the phenyl group or C6H5, equally good. Uh, maybe ET for the ethyl group or C2H5 is also fine because there's only one way to put together one carbon and five hydrogens, so it's unambiguous. I've even seen ME for methyl. And it's not wrong, and if you like to use that, I have no problem with it. It seems a little silly to me uh, because it doesn't seem that much easier to write ME than to write CH3. But, you know, different strokes, right? So, so if that works for you, absolutely feel free. Just make sure as to whether OWL will accept it. I would on a written exam, but uh, you, know, you know by now that OWL will be OWL. Uh, the two smallest aldehydes are formaldehyde and acetaldehyde, uh, and they are almost always called this. Yes, formaldehyde can technically be called methanal because it's a one carbon aldehyde, and acetaldehyde could be called ethanal because it's a two carbon aldehyde. 
but people don't call them that. Uh, both of these are made every day by the ton worldwide. They're extremely necessary industrially, and so a lot, a lot of them is made on a daily basis. Acetaldehyde is kind of an interesting story, if you'll indulge me. Way, way back during the Prohibition era, which I guess was around the 1920s, even before I was born, if you can believe that one, uh, there was, uh, there was a, a drug or a preparation that was made as follows. Uh, ethanol, which is of course a two-carbon alcohol, uh, in, in the body is oxidized first to acetaldehyde, and then acetaldehyde oxidized again to acetic acid, much like we learned about in chapter seven, that you can have two oxidations of a primary alcohol, first to an aldehyde and then to uh, um, a carboxylic acid. So we have oxidizing agents uh, in the cell that, that do this type of reaction for us. The preparation that was made back then would cut off that second oxidation. So what would happen is ethanol would be oxidized to acetaldehyde in the body, and that would not be converted to acetic acid, but acetaldehyde would build up. Now, acetic acid is a very familiar compound, if you will, to the cell. Our body knows what to do with acetic acid. Acetaldehyde is not. And so uh, once a significant uh, um, uh, concentration of acetaldehyde starts building up in the body, it causes problems. And so uh, what they were doing back in the speakeasies and all that in those days is someone would uh, sneak this compound into someone's booze. They would then drink it and uh, acetaldehyde would begin to build up in their body and they'd become violently ill. And then they'd say, that does it. I swear I'm never touching the sauce ever again. So uh, at least that was how it was supposed to work. Uh, luckily, I think adults finally took over, and certainly, uh, certainly alcohol is not an utterly safe thing, and certainly uh, there comes a lot of responsibility with being adults about it, but I have to think that almost anything with the benefit of hindsight back in the 1920s is a better way of dealing with alcohol than that. Uh, the smallest possible uh, ketone would be acetone. It's not possible to make a ketone with fewer than three carbons. You can try if you like, but you won't succeed. Uh, and so again, technically acetone could be called 2-propanone. And if you use that name, everyone would know what you meant, but everyone calls this compound acetone. You might even have used it in lab. Uh, it's good for washing glassware. Uh, uh, generally, the best practice way of washing, washing glassware is first with soapy water, then with water to get rid of all the soap, then with acetone to get rid of anything organic that might be remaining, plus acetone will also remove the water, as water is fairly soluble in acetone. Uh, other simple uh, uh, ketones like cyclopenanone are fairly straightforward to name, and uh, you will certainly get ample practice with that in your OWL assignment. Uh, what about making aldehydes and ketones? Well, we certainly know a lot about that already. We learned uh, in, way back in chapter four that uh, uh, ketones can be made by a friedel crafts acylation reaction. So acylation of benzene with, uh, with an acid chloride, treating with an acid chloride here, such as this one is acetyl chloride, in the presence of either aluminum chloride or iron three chloride, either one would work, uh, will give you a ketone of this type. And of course, if the uh, benzene ring is substituted, that uh, substituent group would then be carried on into the product. And we, you of course are not responsible for uh, substituent directing effects, but you can certainly make uh, um, substituted acetophenones in this way. Uh, there's another way of making acetophenone that you're already familiar with. If you took this uh, secondary alcohol, oh, why don't we call that guy 1-phenylethanol? That sounds good to me, 1-phenylethanol. If you oxidize this compound with either PCC or Jones reagent, it will oxidize it up to the ketone. That's as far up as you can oxidize a secondary alcohol, as we covered in class. So we already know some ways of preparing uh, aldehydes and ketones, and that will certainly carry over and be relevant into uh, this material. 
the one main other idea that I'd like to cover before we start getting into reactions of aldehydes and ketones is uh, you might say the general underlying concept of reactivity of carbonyl groups. And this is something that's going to explain what we see again and again when we start learning about how carbonyl groups react. Uh, and uh, like I said, there's a lot of the reactivity that's in common. Basically, what I think we'll find is the reactions of, of all carbonyl containing compounds fall into about three categories, maybe, maybe four, and we're not even going to go over all of them. You're not going to be responsible for all of them. In this chapter, we're going to learn about carbonyl addition reactions. And there's also, it's also possible to do uh, nucleophilic acyl substitution reactions. We'll cover that in chapter 10. Um, and there are others as well, but all of these reactions are explained by the general nature of the carbonyl group. And what's really important for you guys to know is that any carbonyl group, wherever it may show up in any kind of carbonyl containing functional group. So you'll see I'm leaving these other two bonds to carbon over here unspecified as to what's attached because anything would be attached. And so any carbonyl group is going, is going to have an electrophilic carbon atom. So that carbon atom in the C double bond O will always be electron poor with no exceptions. And there are two reasons for this, both of which I think we can understand at this point. One reason is that all carbonyl groups are resonance stabilized. Here we go yet again with resonance, right? So remember that when we talk about resonance, we are not talking about an equilibrium. And as I said in class, I say that to myself just as much as to you, because even after 25, 30 years, it is to me, or, or I find this to be a somewhat tricky idea. For some reason, our brains would like it a lot more if resonance were in equilibrium, but it's not. What we mean when we say that a species is resonance stabilized is that there's only one real true structure, but we're not able to, uh, to, we're not able using our normal simple valence bond method of drawing structures to show that one true structure uh, all at once. What we mean when we say that these species are resonance stabilized is that all carbonyl groups, again, whatever compound they may show up, are at all times a mixture or hybrid of these two structures. The structure is partly like this and partly like this with the, with the two charges. Um, unsurprising that oxygen would bear the partial minus charge, oxygen's a quite electronegative element. And we've seen uh, carbocations before, certainly they're high energy species, but we know that carbon can bear a formal charge of plus one with three bonds and no lone pairs. So nothing terribly surprising here. Certainly, I think again to no one's surprise, this structure here is going to be by far the major contributor to the overall uh, structure in any given compound or 99.999% of all given compounds maybe. But uh, um, I, I think I'm even willing to say 100. But, um, uh, and that, that makes sense because in uh, this structure, all of the atoms obey the octet rule and there's no charges. This structure has charges on two atoms and the carbon atom doesn't obey the octet rule. But even though this resonance contributor is a minor contributor, even though any given carbonyl will only be a little bit like that structure, that little bit is important. That little bit decides the reactivity and it's why that carbon atom is electrophilic. We see it very directly with resonance. There is a partial plus charge in that carbon atom. No wonder it's electron poor. There's yet another reason why carbonyl groups are electrophilic, and that is explained by, uh, by the inductive effect. And here I've tried my best in this structure uh, to draw a polarity arrow, such as you might have used in Gen Chem showing that at all times there's a partial plus charge on carbon and the electronegative oxygen atom is withdrawing electron density from the carbon atom. So the oxygen will have a partial minus charge and the carbon a partial plus charge. This is not exactly saying the same thing as, reson as the resonance argument. Resonance and the inductive effect are two different arguments. 
This is simply saying that in the uh, electron tug of war for these oxygens and the carb, oh, sorry, for these electrons in the carbon oxygen bond, the oxygen atom is winning because the oxygen atom is more electronegative. And so if the oxygen atom is sucking electron density away from the carbon atom, no surprise that the carbon atom is going to be electron poor. And both of these arguments, both the resonance argument and the inductive effect argument, point to one conclusion. We can expect that nucleophiles of all shapes, sizes, and flavors will want to react with that carbon atom. So species that are Lewis bases or nucleophiles, in other words, that have an extra electron pair available, will want to donate that electron pair to the carbon atom. And then in so doing, will break the carbon-oxygen pi bond. And so in general, this will lead to an intermediate that looks something like this. Now, I don't plan to go extremely heavily into mechanisms in this chapter, especially I'm looking ahead to uh, uh, acetals and hemiacetals. That's a lengthy reaction mechanism. So I don't think I'm going to go through all the arrow pushing with that. I'll just take you through the reaction one step at a time so that you understand how it works. But whether or not we consider mechanisms, I think one thing you'll notice repeatedly <clears throat> is that you'll have a nucleophile attacking that carbonyl carbon, regardless of what else is attached to it. Sometimes the reaction will be an acidic medium, and in those cases we will protonate this carbonyl oxygen first, because an acidic medium, as we've covered in, in well, actually not in class, probably on YouTube video by now, an acidic medium, we don't want to show the formation of any strongly basic anion. Now, in alkaline medium, this is perfectly fine. And in alkaline medium, it will be common for us to see nucleophiles of all shapes and sizes attacking our carbonyl carbon and going to an intermediate that looks like this, after which there's two or three different things that could happen, which we'll cover separately. Maybe we will just protonate this oxygen and wind up with just OH and be done. Sometimes that will happen. Other times, further reactions can happen, depending on what these other two groups are that are attached to carbon. But the unifying feature of all carbonyl chemistry is going to be nucleophiles attacking that electron poor carbon. So that's really important to understand. That I think is actually a good place for us to stop here. And, uh, I think I may even just leave uh, um, acetals and hemiacetals for its own video, since that's a rather a large bite. So other than that, we'll leave that there. We'll see you next time.